So, okay, yes. Welcome everyone back for the last session of the day. And uh, the first speaker of this session is uh, Florian Leclerc. And uh, she will be talking about Lyman alpha halos of individual high Z galaxies detected by Muse. Please. On. Yes. So, hello. So, I'm working uh, within the Muse collaboration in uh, Lyon. Uh, and so, today I want to give you some uh, very new results about uh, the study of the Lyman alpha halos uh, as seen by Muse. So, Lutz already did uh, quite a nice uh, talk review. So um, I can save a bit of time and uh, just um, begin by uh, giving you one number, which is uh, that uh, we detected Lyman alpha halos around, around uh, 145 galaxies, normal star forming galaxies, and uh, which is uh, quite a, a huge number. It represents 80% of uh, the sample. And so it, um, it allowed us to, to get quite a lot of results as Lutz uh, presented it before. And um, so thanks to those results, we could uh, learn more about the CGM properties um, that we know that it's uh, really rich, uh, it has a rich cold gas content, for instance. Um, but as we didn't see clear relation between the halos property and uh, the, the host galaxies, we don't really know, uh, we don't really understand those Lyman alpha halos. So there's still a big, uh, big question mark um, here. Uh, so it was, so those were the results from a spatial 2D studies. So we thought as we have 3D data, it would be a pity not to go uh, to see the spectra, right? So what about the spectral analysis of those Lyman alpha halos? Um, so motivations, so of course better understand the information which is encoded in, uh, in, the, Lyman, um, in the shape of the Lyman alpha line. Um, and maybe shed light uh, on the the origin of those Lyman alpha photons, working together with the uh, simulations and uh, modelers, um, as you can see with uh, Jeremy's talk before, before coffee break. So um, I will address three, three main questions, but I think the central, the main one, the most important one, and the main, is the central one, let's say, is the first one, which is, uh, are uh, the Lyman alpha lines uh, different in the core components and is the halo components? This is the main question we want uh, to address with this study. So uh, to do that, uh, we don't uh, start from scratch, okay? So we use uh, the result from um, the previous study, so the spatial study of the halos, which uh, if you remember, we decomposed the Lyman alpha uh, emission in two components, a core component, which is compact and correspond to the galaxy, uh, UV, in UV, and an halo component. And uh, everything was convolved by the mu PSF. And so now we just add the spectral dimension, okay? So let's say that the intensity varies now with uh, the wavelength. And so for the core components, uh, it's uh, described by an asymmet asymmetric Gaussian because um, we, we, we see that most of the Lyman alpha lines uh, are single picked and asymmetric uh, lines, okay, uh, in our sample. And the uh, halo, uh, component where the int intensity um, is des described uh, varies also with, um, with the wavelengths and is uh, described by a Gaussian. Everything is uh, also convolved by the muse, uh, the muse PSF. Um, so just to illustrate this, let's go for uh, an example. So this is uh, an object of the UDF, um, a Lyman alpha emitters at redshift about five. Uh, you can see here the two scale lengths, so the scale lengths of the core component and the scale lengths of the halo components. And um, I try to image, uh, to illustrate the soup cubes. So we want to decompose um, this uh, soup cube to the two 3D components, let's say. So this is what we got in the spatial plan. Set. I forgot to mention that for the fit, the scale lengths are fixed to the previous measurements. So nothing surprising here, you read, you, we, we found the, the profile, so the core, the, prof, the surface brightness profile of the core components in green, which have been fixed, 
and uh, the, the scale length of the halo uh, components in blue. Uh, so nothing surprising, okay, because it has been fixed here. But for the spectral component, this is what we get from the fit. So the data are in black. Okay, it's a nice uh, isometric line and alpha line. The red is the um, total fit. The green is the spectra, is the spectrum in the core component, and the blue is the spectrum in the halo component. Okay, so we did this exercise for all uh, our Lyman alpha halos, for which we had a, um, reliable um, scale length measurements, because uh, it relies on that. Okay. Of course, I've, have you saw um, the model does not include the double peaks profiles, um, not yet. It would be a, it's a, I, mean, I plan to improve it, but for now it's only for single, single uh, asymmetric, single line peak profiles. So at the end, um, we have a sample of 130 galaxies to, to fit. Okay, so from the fit now, um, we got so several parameters, okay, of the, the different lines. So we got the width of the line in the core components, the width of the line on the halo components, and the relative errors on these measurements, which are calculated by bootstrappings, and um, the uh, peak separation. So again, be careful, I'm not talking about doublet, I mean double peak Lyman alpha emission, I'm just talking about the, the different the, um, peak separation of the components, spectral components. Uh, and the errors. So, as you can guess, some of the errors are, can be really high. So, what I did to be sure that we can say yes, the lines are different, uh, are significantly um, have a width, have a significant uh, different width, let's say, uh, and are significantly um, uh, have a significant uh, peak uh, position, different peak position. What I did is to do a simple hypothesis test. Okay, which uh, lead us that to say that uh, there are uh, 94 objects, uh, which is which represents 72% uh, of our sample, which uh, where the lines uh, are significantly uh, different. I mean, in terms of uh, width, in the core and the halos. I did the same exercise uh, for the peak position, okay, of the line. And again, we have even uh, more objects, 78% uh, of the sample, which shows uh, that the peak of uh, the Lyman alpha emission uh, in the core and the halo are different from this uh, method. And uh, we have uh, 80 galaxies, who show that uh, there is a statistical significance difference um, in the Lyman alpha line profiles in terms of width and peak position. Okay, so, from this study, uh, we say that yes, uh, the lines are, seems appear different in the core and the halos, but how different? So this is the question. So this is uh, the distribution of um, the width of the line in the core in green and in the halo in blue. So I put the, the median or uh, the the, the line, dashed line, and you can see that uh, in the median, the core lines seems narrower than uh, the, the line in the halo. So the line in the ha halo seems uh, wider, basically. Um, but you can also so see that in the, dist um, the distribution. The distribution of the uh, width, uh, probably that maximum in the halo is wider than the peak. Also, okay. So now, if you look at the single galaxy, and I just uh, plot here, um, the ratio between the width of the line in the halo and the width of the line in the core, and this is what I get. So in median, you can see that yes, the Lyman alpha line in the halo is wider, is 1.5 uh, wider than uh, uh, in the core, but which is interesting here is that the distribution seems double picked, right? So we also have some, I mean, many galaxies who, uh, who shows um, that uh, the, the, line in the, the line in the halo is uh, also narrow, I mean, narrower than the line in the, in the core. This is when the result, when the result. And uh, this is the distribution of the peak separation between the two. 
Um, so in median, uh, the Lyman alpha line is shifted by 65 km per second from the core line. Uh, and also, I mean, it's quite a wide, a wide distribution, right? So we can find any kind of objects. Okay, so we can see if those uh, quantities are color um, co correlated. Um, so I don't see if you see something here. It's not really obvious, but uh, it would, it would um, suggest that um, a large difference between uh, the width of the line and the core and the halo imply, implies a large bit peak separation. And maybe it's more obvious here when I only plot the width of the line against the peak, the shift of the line in the halos. And it would suggest that um, if we have a, a wide, the wider line, line in the halo, it would be more red shifted uh, uh, compared, I mean, uh, compared to the, um, the, the line in the core. Okay, so it's one result. Uh, then we can also try to connect the spatial and the spectral properties, why not? Um, so this is uh, the scale length of the halo against the width of the line in the halo. This is the uh, same for the core. We don't see any really significant uh, relation here. Here it's the same, but for the ratio of the two um, full absolute maximum, this is the same for the, the peak separations. Again, color, uh, color coded by the redshift, but still no correlation at all. Um, here I thought maybe if I take the ratio of the two scale lengths, something will happen, but still not. And uh, yes, so it brings me to what do we learn from that? And of course, uh, as we see earlier, we clearly need simulation and, uh, and, and modeling to answer this question and to interpret uh, correctly those, uh, those results. So it's ongoing. Um, so I plan to compare those results with um, the exponent, exponent shell models um, results. Uh, so with Anne and also uh, with um, some simulated objects uh, provided by Jeremy. So this is uh, the conclusion. So we have uh, three main questions, let's say. So the first one, are the core and the halo lines uh, different? The, re the answer, according to this study, is yes. Um, and that the line uh, appear wider and wider in the halo. But we saw that there are, um, I mean, a big variety of uh, results, right? It's just a median. Um, and uh, yeah, about the point two, connecting the special spectral properties. Again, I don't see any significant correlations. And what do we learn from that? We will have to wait for a comparison with modelers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florian. Hi. Uh, can you go back to the uh, one with a purple a histogram with the bimodal kind of distribution? Yep. Yes, yeah, so I was a little confused here. So it looks like, so there's a sample of 94 galaxies. So you've removed the ones already that had a statistically yes. not different? Yes. So is that the if you put those back in, do you still have a bimodal distribution? Because it seems like all those ones would be the ones right in the middle filling in at a ratio of one. More or less. But the thing is, with histogram, you cannot see the error bars. That's why I removed them. I mean, to illustrate it with an histogram. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, but if you, so if you, if you just take the ratio of all the full with half max halos over a full with half max cores for all the ones you measure, does it look like a, a unimodal distribution? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you I don't see this uh, two components. Yeah. I, I mean, it's quite, kind of artificially, right? Okay. It's just to show that we have, uh, I mean, both. That objects. you have both sides. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Any more question? That's why we are doing like uh, this 3D PSF convolved uh, 
uh, fit. I mean, it's a, uh, I don't know. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's a um, PSF converged, so it's taken into account. Um, this PSF effect. Then how much it is affected uh, really? I think we, I don't know. Again? Go ahead, next. Um, yeah, so you were many to ask this question. Um, um, so this, when I do that, this is clearly contaminated by the PSF because, uh, I mean, uh, and you need a really good uh, signal to noise in the halo as well because you're excluding, you know, this part uh, of the halo. Um, I tried, maybe I can show it quickly, to do some, uh, some annulli. Yeah. Some, um, I, I try to extract the spectra in some annulli. Okay. So this is one, of, one example. I don't know. I, I see also uh, it seems to getting uh, wider. Okay. The dots are the full width at maximum and the triangle are the peak, peak velocity. Um, I don't know. Do you, then the, you have big error bars. Do you trust that? It's hard to say. That's why we, we really wanted to ask the question of the, I mean, put some statistic on it, like really statistically with a big sample, can we say something? And not object by object, but I know that at some point we will have to look at object by object if we also want to find some, uh, you know, interesting, uh, like lonely object. <laughs> well, let's thank Florian again. <laughs> And the next speaker is Anna Paulina Alfonso. Do you have the adapter? The adapter? Do you have it? Um, because uh, I don't you can use it. Anna will be talking about uh, from the end of her learning session to the peak of star formation. Where are the LAE's structure telling us? In. Here so, we go. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Anna Paulino Afonso. I'm finishing my PhD in Portugal between Lisbon and Porto. I'm working with David Subral, uh, Yorit Mati, Bruno Ribeiro, Sergio Santos, Juan Callao, and Ali Costovan. And we are trying to understand how Lyman alpha emitters evolve uh, across cosmic time, in particular between redshift 2 and 6. So only for start, and I'm sure that all of you know this, um, Lyman alpha emitters are known to be young, have low stellar mass, low dust content, Maybe they are seen as progenitors of the modern uh, luminosity typical galaxies, and in structure they have normally known as uh, small galaxies with less than two kiloparsecs. They are clumpy and irregular in their morphologies, and they have disk-like uh, profiles. So, given that, and given that you are interesting to understand how this population evolves, and we are only able to do this from redshift 2 and up to redshift 6 and maybe up to 7. I really want to try to understand how the galaxy assembly is correlated with Lyman alpha. And we are very lucky due to the fact that uh, there is a fast increase of the source during this uh, galaxy assembly phase. So what we did is to take the opportunity of the cosmos field and the narrow bands and intermediate bands that are available to the observations in, with Subaru and our one observations in Isaac Newton telescope. And you try to slice cosmos in 16 uh, slices from redshift 2 to redshift 6 in order to have a well uh, consistent and well-selected sample of Lyman alpha emitters in this period. 
So our DAs have a 3D map of the infant universe. And all of our data and our results are public, and the future ones will also be public, and if you are interested on them, you can mail us, and we will be more than happy to collaborate and share the data with you. So giving a, the, briefly the results of the CS4K survey, we have uh, 3,908 Lyman alpha meters, and when you try to do the luminosity function, we see that the Schechter function profile is not enough, and we need a power law component. This is due to the fact that we have agents that are contribu uh, contributing a lot uh, between redshift 2 and 3. So when you do an attempt to compute the escape fraction, we see a rise between these, these redshifts, and we extrapolate it to the epoch of ionization, and you see that most of the source that should be contributing to the ionization. So given that we have this rise of the escape fraction, and given that we have star-forming galaxies and the GNs, so you have maybe a typical Bosni um, population with very young stellar population and a strong evolution probably of the interstellar medium conditions. So this can be boost of the escape of Lyman alpha photons. However, we need to understand better the source and morphology is a key to understand them as well. So our first question was, how do the Lyman alpha emitters look like? And in order to do that, we ask high school students, master students, bachelor students, PhD students, and even postdocs to look in our source and distinguish between compact, disky, and irregular. And then we tried to do some statistics, and we saw that most of the Lyman alpha emitters show a compact um, type if you see in redshift or if you see in an equivalent rate of Lyman alpha uh, or in luminosity of Lyman alpha. But this is not enough, so you really want to understand the structural evolution of Lyman alpha emitters, and in order to do that, we do the two uh, decomposition, uh, decomposition light of the source. However, we are not lucky to have all of them covered with, uh, with the cosmos, uh, in, uh, with the um, the oval in order to peer the UV component, the, the star formation component. So we went to the, the cosmos, uh, used the SES data. We took all the data that we can have. We see the most luminous, brightest ones in order to be better to, to work with that. And then we select the ones that call fit conversion and we are reliable about the, the, the results. So we have 429 stars, and when you try to understand how they evolve in uh, uh, radios and in profile, we see there is little to no evolution in this um, in radio and in the, the, the profile. So you have uh, effective radius of about, about one kiloparsec, and the, the Cersei index below two. So, but you want to understand this is more efficiently, so we have a look as well in the axis radios, and what is telling us the axis ratio is like, this is consistent with a random galaxy orientation. So another thing that we do is non parametric analysis, given the ratio of between the 20% of light and the 80% of light, and we see that the concentration is slow, which is consistent with the values of the typical uh, spiral galaxies in the local universe. So to put it, it in perspectives and to compare it with Lyman alpha properties, we see that we have dependence even in equivalent width and the luminosity of uh, Lyman alpha. So the, the dependence is bigger for equivalent width um, below 50 due to these are the source uh, taken from the narrow band uh, filters. So, but putting everything in scale, what you can say that they are indeed small and compact. They are star forming and young, disk like. Um, the axis ratio is correlating with equivalent width, so maybe this is one of the key uh, things to understand the powering of the escape fraction, which is already seen in the literature and the debated. So, 
In order to understand even better, we need to understand that the galaxies are, have a lot of parameter space, so you need to control them. So one of the things that we did is to fix the equivalent width of Lyman alpha and fix the luminosity and try to understand how the effectivity of radius varies uh, as well as the Cersei kinetics and the concentration. And we see that we have a strong evolution with low equivalent width. However, we don't see uh, a big change in the, the luminosity of Lyman alpha because we don't see a change, in fact, in the slope. We only see going up and down. So if you have a look in the effective radius in the, the top part, we see that uh, indeed we'll, we have correlations uh, with equivalent width and the equivalent widths are, uh, the small equivalent widths are, are, are more or less problematic in the DMC evolution, which is consistent to what is shown in the paper last week from Shibuya et al. So, Bring this to the big picture, we want to compare the, our Lyman alpha emitters with the population that start forming galaxies that we found in our redshifts. Um, and we saw that, in particular between redshift 4 and 6, the size of the typical star forming galaxies and typical Lyman alpha emitters look like the same. If we, if we do the, the ratio, we are uh, a 1. So, our main question is, if you peer into the ionization era, all high redshift galaxies you look like, like Lyman Alpha. They are all having Lyman Alpha or not. So Joanna yesterday tried to answer this part and we do a lot of uh, things we don't really can answer this question. But we can start peering to the, to the epoch of ionization and here is one of the cases that we would like to bring you to our attention is the color one. It's a galaxy at redshift 6.6, uh, more or less. And here we are showing the um, Lyman alpha image of this galaxy. We don't have the UV counterpart to compare with the, the typical size in UV. But in Lyman alpha, we see that this is a very compact Lyman alpha emitter um, emission around 0.3 kiloparsecs. So you are witnessing a source contributing to the reionization. And given that, we are, since we have another galaxies in this uh, redshift range, we want to understand what is the role of the Lyman alpha emitters to the reionization. And in order to understand these galaxies and why you, you are looking for this kind of galaxies, because it shows the double um, component of the Lyman alpha is not very common, so we pose the scenario that this is emerging when the galaxy is emitting and before uh, reaching the ICM it is redshifted and then when it enters the ICM and, and cross our, um, our, our view, we see this, the blue part is attenuated and we are still seeing this double peak. So, this is a work in progress um, and we hope to finish very soon. But this is how in, uh, the bright Lyman alpha emitters and urinization uh, play, a role in, uh, play a role or not. So you are start seeing that they are very clumpy. Um, we are measuring the size of the total galaxy and the clumps to really understand what's going on here and if they link or not with the other galaxies and uh, to see the evolution of the, the properties of this kind of, of, of population. So as of now, I don't want to say much, but they still remain with a very, very small uh, size with one component uh, dominated the, the typical size. So given that, I give you with the take home messages only to focus that we have everything, again, publicly available. The size do not evolve uh, significantly in the first three giga years of the universe. Maybe this is connected with the scape uh, of the photon, uh, Lyman alpha photons, and we still, still have a lot of open questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, questions? So I have a question about the very compact Lyman alpha source. 
So, I mean, we have seen that this lemon alpha halo are very faint. What are your detection limit? I mean, could it be if you could expose longer or have a deeper data that this yes, compactness Yes, we only change? use the data that is available uh, on the Cosmos, but yes, we indeed can ask for more deep data and try to understand because it's tricky to to analyze the surface brightness profile of this kind of source. Indeed, to really retrieve the size of this galaxy, we have to, to reach a new way to, to compute this. Um, but yeah, it seems very, very faint. It's very, very strange. And uh, should be a very uh, interesting case to follow up. OK, thank you very much. Let's thank Anna again. And uh, So the next speaker is uh, Janine Thor, and uh, she will talk about the Vimos, Vimos Ultra Deep Field Survey, the Laman Alpha Escape Fraction up to Redshift 5. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks for staying awake so long. <laughs> um, and thank you very much for the organizers to allow me to present this work in progress on the Vimas Ultra Deep Survey and the Lyman Alpha Escape Fraction. And because it is work in progress, I would ask you to refrain from tweeting any pictures. Um, so to give a brief overview of the motivation, even though we've heard it all throughout the last couple of days, um, we all know that the first galaxies seem to be playing a critical role in reionization and that the study and the search for these is a big driver for major missions like JWST. Um, luckily for us, there also seem to be strong Lyman Alpha emitters, which makes Lyman Alpha a great tool for galaxy evolution. But as gas dust builds up, we've seen there's lots of scattering and absorption going on. So we do expect the numbers of Lyman Alpha emitters to decline with time as well as the escape fraction. And even though current data is scarce, especially at high redshift, our future surveys likely depend very much on these Lyman Alpha emitters, so I think we better understand what's going on. So how does this look in pictures? Well, if we look at the Lyman Alpha escape fraction as the number of photons, um, as a fraction of Lyman Alpha photos that actually escape the host galaxy, then Anna has already shown this picture, but on the uh, right side here, you see this plot from Cassata et al, where the, Lyman, the fraction of Lyman Alpha emitters as a function of redshift increases from redshift two from about 10% to redshift five of about 25 to 30%. And if we look at this plot from Hazardal 2011, um, where he looks at the volumetric Lyman alpha escape fraction, meaning the, just the Lyman alpha photons that escape from a certain volume, um, then you can see that at high redshift, you start to increase as reionization ends, and, but then start to decrease as you go to lower redshift because of the buildup of dust and more scattering and everything going on that kind of stops these Lyman alpha photons from getting to us. Um, so in that sense, with the Lyman Alpha escape fraction, we would be able to pinpoint where reionization ends, but also study the dust buildup in, uh, over cosmic time. Um, so what we're doing now, we're using the Vimos Ultra Deep Survey, which is a optical spectroscopic redshift survey of about 10,000 faint sources between redshift two and six taken with the Vimos spectrograph at the VLT. Um, the survey covers about one square degree in three famous fields, Cosmos, ECDVS, and the VVDS 2 hour field, which conveniently and planned have a lot of multi-wavelength uh, information available. Um, the target selection is mainly based on photometric redshifts. So obviously not all sources that were observed in the end are at that high redshift, but the majority is. Um, and we get about a 75% redshift success uh, for the survey. Um, on the left, you can see this figure here, which is just all Woods spectra sorted by redshift and then plotted up in a row. And you can nicely follow certain spectral features like the Lyman alpha emission and absorption with redshift and as it shifts through the wavelength and spectral range that the spectra cover. Um, 
But since I'm interested in the Lyman alpha escape fraction, I'm cutting down that sample to only the um, sources with the highest spectroscopic uh, redshift flags, uh, the highest quality, and the ones where Lyman alpha actually falls into our spectral range. So I'll end up with eventually uh, about 4,000 objects, 1,400 of which have a Lyman alpha equivalent width of larger than five angstrom. About a third of that has an, a Lyman alpha equivalent width of larger than 25 angstrom. So if we look at the oval redshift distribution for the VUDS survey, on the left you can see it in comparison with uh, other spectroscopic surveys that were available at that time. You can see that really from a redshift of about two and a half and above, we're adding quite a significant number of uh, galaxies to the mix that weren't available before. And if I then distill that down to the sample that I'm actually using in uh, the study and in the plots that I'll show in the following, um, you see in the empty histogram on the right side plot um, the about 4,000 sources I was mentioning. And then in color code, um, the ones with increasing equivalent width. So in solid black, we have equivalent width of larger than five angstrom. In solid red, larger than 25 angstrom. And in solid cyan, um, the ones larger than 50 angstrom. So if we look at the dust, stellar mass, and uh, FUV absolute magnitude distribution for these sources, so we start with dust on the left and then work through stellar mass in the middle and FUV on the right. Same color coding as before. We can say that on average, if we look at the median of these distributions, the higher the equivalent width of the Lyman alpha, the less dust they have, they're slightly less massive, and um, they're also slightly brighter in uh, absolute UV magnitude. Then if we look at the Lyman alpha equivalent width uh, and luminosity in particular, so on the left we have the histogram distribution for the uh, equivalent width of Lyman alpha. Obviously I cut it again at five angstrom and indicated with the lines our cuts of 25 and uh, 50. We do tend out to quite some high uh, equivalent width Lyman alpha emitters, which clearly should deserve special attention to see if there's anything uh, else special going on in these sources, but I'll leave that for some future work. And if you look at the uh, Lyman alpha luminosity distribution, you can clearly see that the peak of this distribution shifts towards higher luminosities if you also go to higher equivalent width, um, where the highest equivalent width um, are basically making up the, the high luminosity end. So um, since I'm looking, want to look at the escape fraction, a sort of a, a quick thing to do is if we're just looking at the star formation rates that we can derive. In black points, you see the star formation rate as a function of redshift um, that is derived from the SED fitting. In red, you see the star formation rate derived from Lyman alpha, um, just per regular Kennicott Schmidt relation things. Uh, then you can see that those two star formation rate um, estimates differ by about an order to two orders of magnitude, which kind of gives you the indication what the Lyman alpha escape fraction is going to be, because we're now just taking the ratio of that, essentially. And then we'll determine on the left, we have the Lyman alpha escape fraction in logarithm for all the Lyman alpha emitters in this case, as a function of redshift. And um, in black is the total you see in thin grayish points, um, basically the, the single escape fractions for the single sources. Uh, the thick points are the medians in this case. And um, then I split the sample by two ma uh, into stellar mass bins, basically just around the middle of the distribution that we had. And what you can see is that the red points, which are the low stellar mass uh, ga galaxies, they have slightly higher escape fraction at each redshift than the high stellar mass galaxies, which are the cyan points over here. Um, I'll, we'll also look at the um, dependency of the escape fraction with uh, the EB minus V dust indicator, and only focus on the thick points here, which are, um, again, the medians for, the, for these points. And uh, you can see that uh, at lower dust content, we have a higher escape fraction, and we also have a higher escape fraction for the higher equivalent with sources. And um, indicated in green, I'm not sure if you can see it, it's sort of here, 
is the prediction from Anne's 2006 paper, so we seem to be somewhat shallower, which also agrees with what Cassata et al. found with a subsample of woods beforehand. Um, if we now look into the sort of volumetric slash global escape fraction, we also take into account the galaxies that aren't actually emitting anything in Lyman alpha to look at sort of the overall Lyman alpha emission from everything. Then um, again, it's escape fraction as a function of redshift. And indicated here the Hayes relation to give you sort of a guide of the eye where that would compare to the literature. Uh, in black, we have the total. In the orange crosses would be the low stellar mass bin, and in the uh, magenta crosses we have the high stellar mass bin. You can even more clearly see that um, distinction between stellar mass. Um, I haven't added any error bars in, so, so at, for the moment I'll say we broadly agree. Um, it's not, as I said, it's work in progress. It's not 100% the final word, but I don't expect any drastic changes in this at this point. And if you've been sleeping until now, this would, you, you, would be your too long didn't listen plot to take away uh, from this talk. And I have a few summaries and some sort of obvious conclusions from what I've just shown. Um, well, with I forgot to actually say it at the point, but with the VODS survey, we find high and low equivalent with Lyman alpha emitters across the entire vector range that we're looking at. Um, on average, we find that the Lyman alpha star formation rates are one to two orders uh, of magnitude lower than the star formation rate uh, from the SED fit. The higher equivalent with objects have higher Lyman alpha luminosity, lower stellar mass, lower dust content, and brighter UV magnitudes. The escape fraction is higher for higher equivalent with Lyman alpha emitters. The escape fraction is higher for lower mass layer Lyman alpha emitters. It's also uh, it's lower for higher uh, dust content in Lyman alpha emitters. And the global escape fraction would be higher for lower mass galaxies as well. And um, lastly, as, you, as you'd seen, I also want to maybe do that as a, bit, as a caution that the escape fraction we've seen can vary quite wildly from object to object. <laughs> and um, as we've heard throughout the week, this is likely due to kinematics, distribution, metallicity of the ISM, and God knows what else that we haven't thought of yet. Um, so do take that into account. And last but not least, I want to point out to all the students and postdocs in the room, uh, there is such a thing called the ESAS Research Fellowship which I'm currently on at the European Space Agency. So it's a 100% independent research fellowship. You can do 100% your own work research during that time in a stimulating space environment. The deadline is 1st of October, so you still have time. And if you're interested, come talk to me. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Lutz, Christian, and Max. Yeah, one of the worrisome properties of these Lyman alpha halos is that, as you've seen, uh, there's a lot of flux is actually emitted at yeah. quite some distance. So that causes aperture effects if you um, measure things through a slit. Yeah. So my question is, first of all, have you estimated the, the approximate uh, size of, the, of these um, aperture losses that you have? And does that contain any corrections? Um, this does not contain any corrections. Um, Paolo Casata has been looking at the extent of the Lyman alpha in comparison to the extent of the galaxy that you would see in the image. Uh, so he's been looking basically at the extended halos. Um, it's not public yet. From what I remember, he does find some extension as well. Um, so um, I'll, um, I'll still have to confer with him how we best correct that uh, when, within these measurements as well. So yeah, absolutely, we, we do see some extension in the picture, but the slit does cut off some of it, yeah. Interesting work. Um, I have a question regarding the selection of Lyman alpha emitters in the VUDS. As I remember correctly, it's a kind of a mixed bag. You have pre-selected objects from photometric redshifts, and um, sources that serendipitously fall on the slip could yeah. Could you please uh, comment on how you take selection effects um, into account in your statistical study? Um, so the primary selection criterion for the VUDS survey is photometric redshift. 
So there's a huge catalog with amount of objects larger than I magnitude of 25 that all have photometric redshifts and out of that just randomly whatever fits on the mask gets picked. So in principle I would not expect there to be a hugely different selection between a galaxy that isn't la emitting Lyman alpha and a galaxy that is emitting Lyman alpha in that process. Um, to account for the rest, um, there's a hugely complicated selection function and I need to look into how this would affect my results, but I, since the sources aren't, it's not Lyman alpha emitters are selected separately from the rest, I would think that that should equal out in those kind of um, effects, but we can talk more about that offline. There is a one minute. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the plot you showed, the F escape versus EB minus V, uh, what is the theoretical curve? Thanks. Um, oh, I don't, I would, don't remember off the top of my head. I think we'd have to ask Anne for that. <laughs> Sorry, I'll have to look it up. I kind of did this plot last minute, so. We can check tomorrow morning a coffee. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, let's thank Janine again. The next speaker is Susanna Vergani, and uh, she will be talking about uh, probing Lyman alpha emission and models with uh, gamma ray burst. Yes, hello everybody. So I will uh, present the work we are carrying mm -hmm. out uh, on the use of gamma ray burst to probe Lyman alpha emissions and to try to test models. So just a few words to tell you what are gamma ray bursts because I don't know if uh, all of you knows what they are. In fact. Uh, gamma rebirths are associated with the short lasting jets produced uh, during the explosion of some very particular uh, massive stars core collapse, uh, that ends their life in core collapse uh, supernova type 1 seabird line. So uh, the gamma rays are detected, are produced in this jet and is a very short lasting emission. And then when the jet uh, shocks again the interstellar medium, it produces another emission that is called afterglow that is very bright at uh, almost any redshift and uh, can be detected so in the near infrared at high redshift. And uh, also the afterglow is a transient emission that disappears pretty quickly. And so we, from the stellar evolution, we know that the best candidate for progenitors for gamma ray bursts are Wolfram A stars. So in fact, we are, uh, looking at objects that really are connected with the sources of uh, ionizing photons as we saw uh, on Tuesday. So when the afterglow, uh, let's say, when we take this afterglow spectroscopy, we have all the traces of the gas clouds that the afterglow uh, went through uh, in its path towards us. In particular, we have traces of the glass clouds of the gamma ray burst of galaxy itself. This is an example where we have the damp Lyman alpha, so we can determine directly the uh, uh, neutral hydrogen content, and then we have uh, metal lines of the GRBOS and on the intervening systems. So I will not go into detail on how we do this measure, but I would like to stress that we are um, not uh, the, the, the metal uh, clouds that we probe are not directly the closest environment of the gamma ray burst, but the closest clouds that we probe are around a few tens of parsecs or uh, towards hundreds of parsecs. So we are probing the star forming region and all the material along the random side, but not the direct circum circumbust environment. Then, once the afterglow flayed, we can go and study the emission line properties of the host galaxies because we have a very precise position of the GRB afterglow. And so we can go and study the counterpart of the GRB DLA, that is the GRB host galaxies. Is a, here I just put an example of the emission lines detected uh, with the shooter of a GRB host uh, Reshi 1.5. So we have access to a population that is selected in a very different way uh, compared to other galaxy selections, galaxy surveys, and is a population of star forming galaxies, not luminosity selected. And so we can extend the galaxy studies up to uh, faint galaxies and high redshift, and we have uh, almost systematically the information on uh, the gas through the absorption lines and on the ionized gas and so on through the emission lines. 
I put here some uh, quick reference on the properties of these galaxies. So they are faint galaxies. They can go to 10 to the 8, uh, put 5 in stellar masses. Uh, Subsolar metalli metallic galaxies, pretty star forming galaxies, and with a pretty high star form specific star formation rate. And also uh, very compact one uh, galaxies, very compact galaxies uh, with sizes of the order of uh, 1 to 3 kiloparsec uh, on average. So when we detect Laman alpha emission from the host galaxies, we really have access to all the information, more or less, that are used in model to model uh, the Laman alpha emission because we have the systemic redshift, the nebular lines, the uh, neutral hydrogen and column density, all the information on the Laman alpha emission lines, H alpha where the spectral coverage uh, allows it, and when we have deep uh, observation to detect it. Uh, the interstellar absorption lines, uh, interstellar medium absorption lines, uh, so the velocity compared to the systemic ratio of, compared to the Laman alpha emission, and this can in principle be done systematically uh, when the instrument uh, allows it, so from ratio 2 to 4 more or less. So we can use those galaxies to characterize the Laman alpha uh, emitter galaxies uh, through uh, population that is selected different from the other galaxies. And also we can use this, uh, all this information to test the models. Which is the pro what is the problem? The problem is that we have very few objects. So of the more or less just the 10% of gamma ray burst of galaxies are Laman alpha emitters. So we are limited to low numbers. But okay, low numbers are better than nothing, especially when we have all this information available. So f to start our work, we selected a sample where we have uh, nice signal to noise information on all these quantities, or more or less all of them. And uh, I plot here the Lyman alpha emission of these objects. As you can see, it is always on the red side. Uh, you can guess some bum bumps, but I don't know. But anyway, it's always on the red side. I put here uh, the um, escape fraction, Laman alpha photons, uh, determined using the H alpha over uh, Laman alpha flux. So the work uh, on the comparison with models is uh, still at its beginning, but uh, we have a few plots to show you where we plot our points compared to uh, the place where, uh, let's say, uh, galaxies, laminar alpha emitting galaxies should be in models. So here we have the, um, the, the velocity of the red peak of the laman alpha compared to systemic versus the uh, fluidal maximums of the line. And as you can see, our points are in good agreement with the, uh, the point predicted by the models. Instead, when we plot the fluidal maximum of the line and the red peak velocity of the line in function uh, versus the uh, neutral hydrogen content, we see that with the, let's say, not so high neutral hydrogen uh, column density, uh, we agree with, models, with the model prediction. Instead, when we go to very high neutral hydrogen column density, here we don't know what is going on because, in fact, uh, for most of the model, we shouldn't expect to see some Laman alpha emission. So it, it's still uh, not so clear what's going on here. We are working on that. Then we try to compare also with the uh, known uh, uh, candidates to be good candidates of Laman continuum photon leakers, that are the Green Peak galaxies. So in orange are the points of our, of our first sample and in blue the point of green pea leakers. So those are the regions where uh, you're supposed to, to have good candidates from Laman continuum leakers. And in fact, you can see that in our case, it's just one galaxy uh, could correspond to this uh, diagnostic, uh, to fulfill the, the, what we see from this diagnostic. And uh, the column density of that galaxy is, is uh, of the neutral hydrogen is uh, 10 to the 19.5 more or less. So what about gamma ray burst of galaxies as the Laman continuum leakers? We have just one detection of uh, Laman continuum photons um, on a gamma ray burst afterglow that is shown here. So for which we have again the determination of the natural hydrogen content densities as well as the metallic emission lines, uh, absorption lines. So it's just one, but it's extremely interesting because this figure is not updated. Sorry about that, but I still think that is the only one, uh, only the only one con uh, Laman continuum leaker at uh, uh, such faint uh, magnitude. 
and those are the magnitude that you would expect at very high redshift. So in principle, this can be a good candidate to study what is going on at very high redshift. So to do that, we need uh, also to study the emission and properties of the host galaxies, and so we need the issue their time, and I hope we will have it sooner or later. So what about more in general, uh, GLBOS galaxies at, at very high redshift and what we can do uh, on, in the context of Lemon Alpha? Um, actually, GLBOS galaxies at very high redshift are very faint. I report here the only three OS galaxies detected with HST, those are the magnitude, at redshift uh, larger than five. There are other OS galaxies with other observations, but we have no detection down to even to the 30 magnitude limit. So they are extremely faint. And that should correspond to the, uh, let's say, the bulk of the faint star forming galaxy population at that redshift. So we decided to, uh, this is our DHST image, we decided to go and look if we could detect Lyman alpha for one of those, that is this one, because for this galaxy that is a redshift six, uh, we have a very nice shooter afterglow spectrum with all the information I told you before, so we could determine the neutral hydrogen density, we have the metal absorption lines, and so on. So we uh, obtained time on MUSE, and even if the observation were carried out just for half of the time that we asked for, unfortunately, we have a Lyman alpha detection, is this, this is the OS galaxy, and also of the intervening survey that were not detected in HST, but anyway, this is not the topic of this talk. So we have the Lemon Alpha detection of the GRBS galaxy. And uh, so we have a, well, an object for which we have a lot of information from the emission line, the absorption lines, a redshift six. So of course, to detect the nebular lines in this case, we cannot do it with the shooter. We have to wait for JWST. But already we can use it uh, to try to test the model, the model, so Lemon Alpha emission. And unfortunately, since uh, the observation were just half of the time that we had, uh, we have a very poor signal-to-noise detection, it's just a signal-to-noise tree, so this is the uh, model test. Uh, as you can see with the signal-to-noise, we cannot say so much, so we hope to, have, uh, to, to be able to complete our observation, also to look if we have uh, a halo associated to this detection, and if there are uh, other Lyman alpha emitter this ratio. We already detect one, not so far from this of galaxy, so we hope to detect more. So I leave here my conclusion. Uh, I hope that I convince you that gamma ray burst uh, allow a different selection of lama alpha emitters or possibly also lama continuum leakers. We have low numbers, but within this a few cases, we have a lot of information. So we hope to use it to test the lama alpha models and also to compare uh, what we see if, with the simulations. And uh, this population allows to, this, to do these studies up to the Irish redshift and down to the faintest galaxies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susanna. Max? This is extremely cool stuff. Can I just ask two short questions? Um, I'm not, I'm, they're really naive, so please be. Uh, like, so with this uh, afterglow, you can also measure the transmission of the Lyman alpha on the blue side, right? Lemon alpha on the blue side. Yeah, like if you have a new, you know, the IGM transmission. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The, uh, yeah, sorry. What are these values typically? I'm not working on this, but there are. Uh, so you mean the Lemon alpha transmission in the IGM? Yes. Not, not the, the one associated with the OS galaxy. No. Okay, so uh, there are people working on that, but for this, it's much better to use quasars. Yeah, no, I know, but so, it's nice that you have this sideline, you know. Yeah. But, but uh, the second short question is, uh, did you test if your Lyman alpha spectrum changes after gamma ray burst over some time, over like years or something? Uh, no, but uh, the time scales that we live are uh, too short. Uh, so in, in principle it can change, but uh, not on short, such short time scale because of the gamma ray burst. So I mean, if you mean some changes that are due to the some changes that are due to the gamma ray burst, yeah. So for for this, you have to wait much 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 longer. So even if I observe now and in ten years, it's not supposed to affect the spectra that I see of long enough. Any more question for Susanna? Yes. No, 
Uh, it's simply that in Quasar you have such much higher statistic and this is the problem because with gamma ray burst, uh, even if you take the entire number of spectra that we have up to date, there are like 100, let's say, not 100, maybe 150, but not more than that. Instead, with Quasar, your statistic is uh, huge. Okay, let's thank Susanna again. So the next speaker is uh, Marco Castellano, and uh, he will be talking about uh, high Raman alpha visibility from a reionized over density at redshift seven. Thank you. So um, my talk will uh, will touch the issue of the visibility of Lyman alpha emission at redshift seven. As you know, uh, what do I mean by Lyman alpha visibility? Uh, as you know, the fraction of Lyman alpha emitting galaxies among the Lyman Bragg galaxy population has been uh, a key uh, probe of uh, the rayonization timeline used in, uh, in this last year and a uh, key information on uh, the uh, late rayonization scenario. Something very interesting that has emerged from uh, these studies is that a patchy topology for this uh, Lyman alpha visibility is favored uh, by, uh, by uh, the observation. So uh, what's the origin? Uh, uh, the origin of this patchy topology is uh, one important uh, issue that uh, we, we need to address. Among the various lines of sight that uh, we have analyzed in the papers uh, released by our group, um, mostly by uh, Laura Penterici in these past years, uh, it, there are indeed some uh, peculiar line of sight. Uh, most importantly, this one, which is this uh, uh, BDF, uh, BDF field, where we discovered two bright, uh, high equivalent to it, uh, uh, Lyman alpha emitting galaxies that are close by at a distance, projected distance of two uh, physical me megaparsec at both at a redshift around, uh, around seven. So they are uh, most likely associated in, uh, in space. So um, the, the question was whether additional sources were also contributing to a crea the creation of a rayonized region allowing the Lyman alpha from these galaxies to escape. And we explored this, uh, this problematic through uh, dedicated HST observation with ACS and with FIG3 to look for fainter LBGs that could possibly contribute to the creation of a rayonized region uh, around these two uh, Lyman alpha emitting galaxies. We found uh, indeed uh, a high number of uh, reliable fainter Lyman Bragg galaxies, consider that the old data that enabled the, the detection of the uh, two Lyman alpha emitters were ground based data limited to uh, roughly 26.5 in wide band, and now we could go deeper by one magnitude thanks to. HST, and uh, the result uh, we found was that indeed there is a factor of three to four over density in this region. There is not such a comparable over density around the similar Lyman Bragg galaxies, ga Lyman Bragg galaxies of similar luminosity in the candles fields, and uh, everything points to something consistent with uh, the expectation of inside-out rayonization scenarios. Namely, that uh, uh, a positive relation exists between the visibility of Lyman alpha, so Lyman alpha pass through uh, the IGM, which is uh, uh, rayonized, uh, locally rayonized, and the galaxy over density. The next step, of course, was to look for spectroscopic confirmation of, uh, uh, of these galaxies. So we were granted more than 30 hours observation. We forced to at VLT with the very same setup uh, Grissom that uh, we had used for uh, confirming the other two Lyman alpha emitters. 
observing all the new candidates, uh, so fainter objects plus one bright object that had escaped by photometric scatter the, the, previous, uh, the previous selection. And the interesting result is that uh, the bright one is confirmed, but the, the faint one are not. So we find uh, a new Lyman Alpha emitting galaxy. This is a, an, uh, another bright galaxy close to L star. It is at the very same redshift on a, the, uh, another previously known Lyman Alpha emitter and very close also um, in, uh, in physical space. This is the new uh, Lyman Alpha emitter and these are uh, the uh, previously known spectra from the Vanzella 2011 uh, uh, paper. Um, as you can see, these are the measured uh, full width and, uh, and equivalent width. These are really look like uh, twin galaxies. These are the spectra in the, in the new mask. And it's uh, very interesting to look at uh, their uh, position in the sky. The red square is the old uh, um, VLT data uh, for the very first Leibnumberg galaxy selection. These are the HST wideband follow-up. Uh, of the BDF3299 and BDF521 that are the Vanzella 2011 emitters and this is the new emitters. These are two uh, Lyman alpha emitters at the very same redshift and only 90 kiloparsec distance. The third one is at 2 megaparsec projected distance. So uh, as I told you this is the nice result but uh, in the mask there were also many other objects, fainter candidates, that we thought were contributing to the creation of the rayonized bubble. And uh, um, so the question is, uh, uh, is the uh, fraction of uh, detected Lyman alpha lines among the bright objects that are L star uh, galaxies and among the fainter ones, uh, what, um, what is this telling us? Uh, it is commonly, the samples in this kind of studies are commonly divided into bright and faint, adopting a cut at uh, around 20.25 uh, in um, minus 20.25 in, in, in UV. So as in, in this case also we divide the sample in this way. So out of five galaxies in the full BDF field, we confirmed three as I told you, but we have 12 highly reliable faint objects with no Lyman alpha detections. What we can do is to uh, run uh, um, simulations, Monte Carlo simulation, reproducing all observational and selection effects uh, and see what is the expectation in terms of uh, detection of Lyman alpha for the various populations assuming either a visibility, so an equivalent width distribution that is the same uh, that we on average measure at redshift 7, so the one that is commonly considered as pointing to a half neutral uh, universe, or the one at redshift 6 where rayonization is, uh, is already uh, completed. We can also assume uh, the redshift distribution that are either picked at redshift 7 or more extended throughout the Lyman Bragg galaxy selection range, but this has turns out to have uh, no, no effect on the results. So what happens? <laughs> the detecting three galaxies, three Lyman alpha among the bright galaxies is even more than what we would expect uh, in, uh, uh, at redshift six. So we were expecting uh, the, to detect one, uh, we detect three. Of course, the numbers are low, but we can fairly claim that detecting three out of five uh, clearly points to this region being uh, reionized. So Lyman alpha is coming to us with no, no uh, IgM, neutral IgM, cancelling it out. On the other hand, detecting none faint, ga, Lyman alpha emitting lines among the fainter candidates uh, is not at all consistent with the previous scenario. This is more consistent with the alpha neutral redshift 7 universe where we were expecting indeed to detect about one. We detect zero, and we, um, we were expecting one, so this is even less, we detect even less than we could expect, but we can say it is consistent. In a reionized universe, uh, 
we were expecting a redshift six like universe we were expecting around four detections so the two populations are, are a bit different the bright galaxies are confirming the existence of a ionized bubble at redshift 7.1 faint galaxies do not what there are possible explanation for this first of all maybe bright galaxies indeed are in a ionized bubble but faint galaxies are just outside we are um, we are sure quite sure we are co quite confident that the, also the faint Lyman Bray galaxies uh, are uh, in robust, uh, robust uh, um, candidates at redshift 7, so no low, very low Z contaminants, but they might be just outside the few megaparsecs that are reionized. Another possibility is that for physical reason internal to the galaxies, uh, the Lyman alpha uh, transmission, the Lyman alpha escape fraction from faint objects uh, is, is very low. Maybe the bright objects are uh, uh, bursty galaxies with uh, accelerated evolution uh, due to accelerated evolution within the overdensity, while the fainter ones are more evolved and Lyman alpha escapes less from, from them. We can take the observed photometry and see and, and look for all the uh, and, and compute the all mm, the physical properties that match the observed photometry and from the physical photo, uh, properties within uh, one sigma confidence level compute what's the ionizing capability of these galaxies to see Lyman alpha we need at least a bubble of 1.1 megaparsec sides and we can take all possible models with the BPAS library and uh, letting uh, the escape fraction of ionizing photons to vary from 0 to 1, all the various uh, comparable star formation rates and ages, and see what's the radius uh, the, the on the, this y-axis, the radius uh, uh, versus the age of the model of the bubble we can, we can build. It turns out that uh, the, two, uh, the new emitter and the one of the old one can make it by themselves uh, with uh, quite an high escape fraction and moderate star formation rate over 100 megahertz. Uh, they can build their own bubbles, but the third one, the one that is far away from the twins, cannot. Of course, it's, uh, it's obvious that we have to sum the contribution of the two galaxies that are very close at only 90 kiloparsec. When we do it, it turns out that with, let's say, fairly low escape fractions, can, they can make it over a few me, under the mega years of constant star formation rate at a few tens solar masses per year. They can build a large knife bubble. Of course, the, the other one is left, uh, is left alone. AGN can, can uh, possibly do the job, but we do not detect any nitrogen 5 in the spectra. Of course, there are classes of AGN that uh, are comparable with the limits we can set on, on, uh, on the nitrogen-5 emission, so we really cannot rule out uh, AGN, not to mention past AGN activity, so the, the issue is still on the table. And final, very final uh, thing to mention, uh, maybe it's, uh, the, there are uh, objects that are even beyond the detection limits of our HST imaging, such as the clustered uh, ultra faint dwarfs discussed in this paper by Eros Vanzella last year and this year that are likely progenitor of, of globular clusters, so very faint minus 15 objects that you can detect only in lensed fields. Maybe this kind of galaxies we cannot detect in such a blank field. Maybe they are uh, putting their ionizing budget together with the bright ones. It's JWST that can possibly answer all, all uh, this question. And this is going to be a very hot topic also for the future with cross-correlating uh, over density and SKA signal uh, to constrain reionization. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So it's time for one, two question. Yes. Hi, Marco. This is beautiful work. Thanks for showing this. Um, in the one new galaxy that you detected, I was wondering if the Lyman alpha profile, there's some structure in it, right? Like, is that real or is that noise? Like, there seem to be, like, 
two bumps there was the bump on the right, just next to Lyman alpha, in your topmost spectra, spectrum. Uh, this one, you yeah. say two bumps. Yeah, like what's happening there? Uh, you... Yeah, we discussed about this. We don't think it's significant because there is an excess noise here. You can see this cyan uh, line, which is the noise spectra. So there is a skyline here, residual. But uh, yeah, we, we took this in consideration, but we don't think it's significant. Thanks. Other questions? Well, then uh, let's thank Marco again. Thank you. Okay, so our uh, last speaker for the day is uh, Jose Miguel Rodriguez Espinosa, and uh, is going to talk about the spectroscopic confirmation of a protocluster at ratio 6.5. Thank you. I've taken the liberty to change the title with the, with the agreement of polis, because since the time I sent the abstract and the, the latest work, I, I <laughs> tell you something more interesting. So these are my colleagues. Oh, sorry. These are my colleagues, especially Miguel Mas, who is here. As you know, realization, people think that was achieved by low luminosity galaxies. And very often they are clustered together. So I will show you how a spectroscopically confirmed protocluster has produced an ionized bubble, which is incredibly large. And this is part of the ALBA project that we started a few years ago, essentially to search for low luminosity galaxies before the epoch of realization. The field selected was the Subaru field. And we observed with three relatively narrow filters, which, which are the shards filters. We performed deep imaging in three filters, and we detected 45 very faint sources. Then we also uh, applied for spectroscopy. We could put only 16 objects in the mask plus three fillers and one, and one of the Uchi uh, sources that you, we use as reference. And we detected 11 out, out of the 16 sources. Now, all, all the work that we have done till today has been in this four paper. The first paper is already published, deals with the photometry of the, of the sources. And there are three papers that are about to be submitted in, in a couple of weeks. With the spectroscopy, with the evolution of the protocluster, which I, I think I talked about, uh, about it two years ago here. And then what I'm going to talk today. As you can imagine, the spectroscopy data reduction was very difficult. And so we did it separately at the IAC, which is my institute and at the Department of Astronomy of the University of Florida, which, is, which are part of the collaboration. This is a coade spectrum. You can see the, the, the black spectrum down there is the sky noise, which in this area of the, the sky is full of lines. Let me show you a few of the detected sources. These are some of the spectra, some others. As you can see, we are uh, fighting with the noise. But anyway, let me introduce you the, the, 
the topic. People say that reionization was done in patches, stochastically. There were some bubbles that initially formed. This bubble grew, joined together, etc., etc., formed larger bubble, and then the universe became realized. So, from the spectroscopy that you've seen before, we derive essentially fluxes and equivalent width, all luminosities. And we derive a, 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 scale, fra a scale fraction of lambda alpha from the equivalent width using an expression in a recent paper by Sobral and Mati. And then, using the, the scale fraction of lambda alpha, we, detect, we compute the intrinsic Lyman alpha luminosity. And finally, we measure the number of ionizing photons uh, using that expression where the constant is, uh, contains everything to give you the right, uh, the, the right units. And this was given um, by Miguel Mas in his talk. So this is the table with the, with the, <coughs> excuse me, with the uh, observed parameters, the, the integrated Lyman alpha luminosity in, 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 the, in the last but one column and the number of ionizing photons. So the, the, the number that is circled in, at the bottom is the total ionizing flux in, in that protocluster. I, I can explain you how I, I have arrived to this number, but in order to be brief, I'll keep on. So, from a paper by Finkelstein in 2012, the critical ionizing flux density required for reionization is about 8.3, 10 to the fifth, 50 photon per second per, me, per cubic megaparsec. We observe a volume in our, in our case in the protocluster, which is 11,000 megaparsecs. If we divide the, if we divide that number by the, by 11,000 megaparsec, we, are, we arrive at 24, 10 to the 50 photon per second per cubic megaparsec. This is about three times the photon number, the photon density required to reorganize the universe. So that bubble containing our protocluster is reorganized. But not only that, because there is enough photons, we can enlarge the bubble and see how much, how, how large it could be with the available photon density. So, the, the, the volume that we get is 32,000 megaparsec which is a bubble with a radius of about 20 megaparsec at a redshift of 6.5. This is huge by, by the standard at that time in the universe. And I think this is the end. And since it's very late, I leave you to read the, the summary. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have time for questions. Yes. Say that again. I, I, I leave it. Sorry. I was wondering if you have any spectral signatures as well that could indicate that they reside in the bubble. 
I mean, I know the position because we have the redshift and position. Uh, we know that they are close together. I, I could have brought a, a, a picture of the, of the special, but they are very close to the two Oshi uh, sources that are very strong star forming sources, and we look around those looking for, for new uh, sources, low luminosity sources. So I have a question. Um, one is, uh, do you know if you have Lyman break galaxies? I mean, not necessarily meeting Lyman alpha in this bubble. Bubble? Do you have a, an idea? No, no, because we use three three filters, as I said mm -hmm. before, at the beginning. Yeah. Okay. And the idea was that we set, we set up the center filter to a redshift of 6.5, which is where the two Ochi sources were. Mm -hmm. Then we did very deep observation in, in the left filter to discard that they had any continuum uh, in, this, in this part. And then in the other filter, we also integrate enough to, to see if we could get some Lyman break sources. Mm -hmm. continuum sources in the, yeah. in the right filter. But the problem with the filter is that it's a bit larger and much less um, sensitive. sensitive. Okay. So we well, didn't see any. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Let's thank all the speakers of this session again. <laughs> and uh, well done, everyone. Now it's time for getting ready for dinner. <laughs> Dinner is at 8.30, don't be late, yes. because there is a surprise afterwards. Uh, at 8.30, eventually a bit later, we will start with the concert, probably outside. Uh -huh, okay. if, in case the weather is getting a bit unstable, we'll have to, to go inside and to use this hall, but uh, I'm, I hope that we'll be able to be outside. So, hurry up with the dinner, okay?